Thanks for coming. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. How are you all this morning? Warm? Better than last week? A little. Yeah. 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 Um, thanks for having me. I'm going to chat a little bit about types of plants, one of my uh, favorite subjects to talk about. Uh, how many of you were here last year? A couple of you, okay. Um, I spoke uh, for, I don't know, about 20 minutes or so on uh, plants uh, last year. Mostly uh, was, uh, winter uh, plants that we might have uh, problems with. So this time I was going to talk about some uh, more, more summertime, uh, warm weather type plants that, uh, that you might get into with, uh, with your cattle. <coughs> And so those of you that were uh, that heard me last year, uh, these first uh, three or four slides, uh, you can just take a nap. Uh, they're the same ones. Uh, I'll wake you up uh, here in a minute when I start uh, on uh, Perilla Men. But uh, I usually like to try and introduce a little bit uh, with, you know, just some, some introductory stuff. So at least in, in Louisiana or in, in certainly if you, you know, stretch out in the United States, there are you know, hundreds or thousands of species of, of toxic plants and weeds and, you know, uh, we, could, we could probably walk out there in the lawn and, and find uh, three or four things that uh, in some fashion uh, are toxic. Now, probably isn't going to be bad enough to kill cows or sheep or horses or anything like that, but they, you know, they did have some toxic principles in them. They're sporadically distributed and what we see in, uh, you know, what we see here in central Louisiana uh, there will be some differences if you get up towards the, uh, the Arkansas border and certainly, you know, go down towards Homa and, you know, uh, New Orleans and get in that area and there are, there are plants. I mean, you go from Baton Rouge to New Orleans or Homa and you'll see some differences. A lot of similarities, but there are some things that, uh, that just don't survive uh, the winters, especially like we just had. Um, but you get down, you know, further close to the uh, Gulf Coast and there's some things down there that, that, that do pretty well. Thankfully, most of the toxic plants are unpalatable, and so animals don't, they're not out there looking for them. Uh, there are a few that they, that they really like, and we have to be a little bit more careful with, and I'll talk about a couple of those. And if, you know, if you, if you keep your livestock healthy and in good, good flesh, uh, then, you know, they're, they're less likely to go out there and start searching around for something else that, that they shouldn't be eating, uh, that might even be available to them. So offer them a proper diet. Minimize contact by, you know, proper spray, weed control, things like that, fencing them off, uh, and that'll go a long way in um, minimizing any problems. Uh, Ashley's got me scared, but she said, I can't back up on this, so um, I don't want to hold my finger down too long. And so, <coughs> usually when, <coughs> when I'm talking to students, I'll break this down into three different slides, and I'll spend 15 or 20 minutes on this, and I'm going to run through it a little bit more quickly here so I can get into, into the meat. Um, but factors that affect toxicity, and kind of break them down into plant factors, animal factors, and environmental factors, and just you know, kind of think about things like that. Um, so the plant factors, of, you know, what's the plant? Uh, who knows what pigweed is? I'm sure none of you have in any of your pastures. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you know, the, 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 there's about 30 different varieties of pigweed. I don't know how many different varieties Louisiana has, but worldwide there's something 30 or 35 different varieties of this stuff. And uh, you know, down here we've got some that have thorns all over it. And that's people call that spiny amaranth. And there's another variety called red root pigweed that uh, that one doesn't have any thorns on it. You know, it's there. If a cow eats, you know, a certain amount of either one of them it's gonna be about the same. The, the, the toxicity level in those plants are about the same. But you know, if I'm a cow, I'm like, well, you got thorns here, no thorns. I think I'll eat the one without thorns. And so that plant may be more likely to be consumed because it, it doesn't hurt when you eat it. So you know, there are things like that. Uh, stage of growth, some plants, as they mature, they become more toxic. Uh, nightshades, the, the berries, and the, uh, the, the, the immature berries are the most toxic part of the plant. And, you know, uh, things like uh, oleander, you know, the roots, stems, leaves, flowers, seed pods, and you know, everything's poisonous on that plant. So there's a lot of variation in, in what's toxic uh, from one plant to another, what parts are toxic. Uh, and then the condition or the health of the plant. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, coffee senna and uh, sickle pod here in a bit, but that one, um, 
I think becomes more palatable when it's uh, when it's dying, and and there may be some changes uh, associated with that. So the health of the plant may uh, may have some effect on, and it, it could become more toxic, but it could also just become more palatable uh, as those leaves are dying. Sometimes sugars in the leaves become concentrated, and so animals are, are attracted to it and may be more likely to eat it. And then we get to animal factors. Uh, the species of the animal may, may play a role. Um, uh, red maple. Uh, does anybody know what, what, what animal is affected if they eat red maple leaves? Horses. And nothing else is poisoned by it. So, um, you know, if, if, uh, if cows or goats, pigs, what have you, uh, eat red maple leaves, it, it just doesn't cause any, any issues with that. But horses can, can, I mean, they can eat it and die uh, if they eat enough of it. So the, there are a few examples like that with a, a couple of different plants and, and whatnot. Age, size, the condition of the animal. And if you've got a 200-pound uh, you know, calf and a 1,500-pound cow, <clears throat> obviously that cow can consume more oftentimes uh, before it's going to become uh, intoxicated. Uh, an old cow might not be able to, you know, their liver or their kidneys may not be able to process and, and get rid of some of those toxins like a, a, a younger animal might. <clears throat> and then the amount ingested and the time period ingestion, that can be extremely important. Um, I tell my students, I, um, you know, uh, chocolate, uh, certain types of chocolate, especially like baking chocolate, is, uh, can be toxic to dogs and cause cardiac problems, heart problems. And you know, if you've got a Chihuahua, you know, and a Great Dane, uh, and I've got a handful of chocolate that, uh, you know, hold that out, well, they're dogs, they're going to eat it all. Um, well, that, you know, that Great Dane can take more of that than the, than the Chihuahua can. But I can take that same amount of chocolate that would kill the Chihuahua, and I can give it a little bit every day as a treat and not have a problem. Okay? But give it all to them at once, and we, we get into problems. And the same thing happens with livestock, right? Um, and, but it also depends. It, go, it varies from plant to plant. Some are cumulative, and so they can eat a little bit now, a little bit later, and a little bit later, and still die or get sick. Uh, whereas others, if they stretch that out, it's not a problem. Uh, environmental factors at the time of the year, uh, the soil type. Uh, when, I, when I look out the window there, I don't see any cactus growing out there. You know. um, they don't like it here. You know, We get too much rainfall. It's uh, you know, not enough sunny days. It gets too cold or whatever. The soil isn't, you know, the pH of the soil isn't right. It's something like a clay soil and it's, this is too loamy or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, how cold does it get? And, uh, and all those things uh, determine uh, why we don't have cactus growing out there and why what, what is out there likes uh, central Louisiana. So all those things combined, uh, you know, some affect the, the actual toxicity of the plant, others affect the fact, uh, make it uh, available uh, to the animals. And so it may not have, uh, some, some factors may not actually change the toxicity uh, but make them available to the animals or, or make that, uh, that opportunity for the cows to get the plants and consume them. And then losses uh, due to toxic plants, you know, it's not just dead uh, versus alive, so there's a lot of different things. And I'll just kind of run through these quickly. Um, so we do have, you know, death mortality down here at the bottom. It could be, you know, just weight loss, chronic weight loss, or the animals aren't, aren't uh, and they're not eating as well as they should, or they're, they're not putting weight on like we would like them to. You can get into uh, birth defects and abortions with some things. The you know, cost of, of fencing areas off. Um, treatment costs, you know, veterinary costs, things like that. And then, you know, some of these things will cause just, you know, maybe chronic uh, kidney disease or chronic liver disease, and the animals just kind of linger, and then they don't, you know, they're, they're not good productive members of, of the herd. All right, um, so we'll start off, this is uh, Perilla Mint. Uh, this is a, uh, many of you are probably familiar with this. You might see it in the pastures. Hopefully you don't have too much of it. It, um, it is a true mint. You know, if you tear these leaves, it has a minty smell. The, uh, the genus is uh, Perilla, Perilla frutescens. It has um, square stems. All mints have square stems. This will get, you know, this, uh, oh, I just tried to back up, Ashley told me I can't do that. This plant will get uh, two or three feet tall, maybe uh, three or four feet tall at times. It's a summer annual. Uh, I spent, um, spent about 20 years, 22 years in uh, East Tennessee. 
and uh, I could pretty much, you know, set my watch to it almost. It was kind of the middle of uh, July when I started seeing it pop up in the pastures. Uh, here we're a little bit further south, and so we're going to see uh, we're going to see it earlier in the year. Uh, maybe get up towards the uh, state line, probably be you know late June, early July, I would guess. Notice on this uh, slide here, if you if you turn your imaginators up a little bit, you can kind of see those leaves have a little bit of a purple hue to it. And some people call this purple mint uh, instead of gorilla mint. Uh, the um, this is this is a, a an economic um, an economically significant plant in the southeast. It ranges all the way from Texas to, to Pennsylvania. Uh, it takes up pretty much all the, the southeastern part of the country. It's um, the leaves, and you can't see on these pictures, but the leaves are serrated. Uh, you turn the leaves upside down, look on the back side of the leaf, you'll see that purple color uh, a lot better. And some of you may have this in your yards, flower beds. Uh, some of the ornamentals are so dark, they, um, they almost look black. Uh, they, they get really, really dark. This plant likes partial shade. You won't see it growing right out in the middle of a pasture. Uh, it's usually going to be kind of along a uh, tree line. Um, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to be way deep in the woods either. It, it likes a little bit of shade, it likes a little bit of sun. Uh, you know, put a big oak tree right in the middle of the pasture and there might be a ring of, of perill mint that just kind of surrounds it sometimes. But when, uh, when I would, so this, it's a summer annual um, and it, uh, it does well uh, on into the fall um, when we don't, we may not have much uh, rain, maybe kind of drought conditions. It, it's still doing well, and the summer pastures may be getting pretty poor. Bermuda grass is kind of, you know, it's, it's nothing but uh, uh, you know, not, not any nutritional value there anymore, and the cows are looking for something to eat, and oftentimes this is still nice and green, and so it may be attractive to animals. Normally, it's, it's not terribly, <coughs> terribly palatable, but uh, when they get hungry enough, they'll, they'll eat it. This is, uh, this is just showing what it looks like after it's died, and that's still toxic. So horses, uh, cattle, uh, pretty much any of our livestock that eat this. Uh, each one of these little sort of bell-shaped uh, uh, pieces here, that there's one seed. Uh, and the seeds are about, oh, maybe um, about a millimeter, millimeter and a half um, in diameter. You'll get some pretty large growths of this uh, at times. You, uh, you find uh, practical forest. So, so the, the, the toxin in it, they're called perilla ketones. And, and I'm, I'm talking about perilla mint a lot. But uh, there are quite a few other things that will do this. Um, anybody ever feed any sweet potatoes to cattle? Or know anybody that does? Uh, I had a veterinarian call me just probably about a month ago uh, and sent me a, not this picture, but one just about like it and said, well, moldy sweet potatoes uh, cause lungs that look like this in cattle. And I said, that's exactly what they look like. And I said, you have somebody uh, feeding moldy sweet potatoes, and he said, well, I haven't been out there to see, but uh, the fellow's feeding sweet potatoes, and so it, uh, I'm sure some of them are moldy. Uh, sweet potatoes are okay until they get a mold on them. It's the mold that produces the toxin. It's not the sweet potato, but a mold uh, that produces the toxin. It'll do the same thing that, that perilla mint will. Um, uh, once I've heard of uh, cattle on ryegrass um, uh, get this, and, and the owner actually had some cows and he crops and he posted, and uh, he said, I've been he said, I, I, you know, move the cows on, you know, um, uh, for, a, you know, a 30 minutes to an hour, you know, for a few days and, and, and you know, get them, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for, you know, get them ready or, or, or getting them um, uh, adapted, <laughs> thank you very much, getting them adapted to, uh, to eating that. And you know, kind of changing their diet slowly, which you're supposed to do. And they've been on there for 18 days, and then he lost uh, three cows uh, over a period of about 24, 36 hours, and uh, had them posted. And sure enough, uh, that's what it was. He took them off, and for a week or so, and then slowly went back and, and didn't have any problems again. Ryegrass isn't one that usually does this, so that was a little bit surprising. But uh, mustard, uh, turnips, things like that. Usually we're not grazing animals on these things, but uh, maybe somebody tosses some over the fence. So what, what this disease does, or what these toxins do, they cause uh, pneumonia and emphysema uh, in the lungs of cows. And looking at this uh, piece of lung tissue here, these, these kind of blue clear streaks, uh, you shouldn't be able to see those uh, on a normal lung. And so that, that's showing us that there, there's a lot of damage, there's a lot of edema uh, in the lung of this cow. 
So, um, you know, this, this is kind of a typical picture here, this whole scene, you know, she's got her neck stretched out, she's got her mouth open, she's salivating, she's trying to, she's trying to breathe, she's trying to oxygenate her tissues, and she can't do that very well. Uh, there isn't much that we can do as far as, once these animals become affected, uh, there isn't any specific antidote or treatment or anything like that. Um, you know, get the animals off, um, you know, whatever it is that, that they're consuming. And if you do have to move them, you know, try to move them as slowly as possible, you know, just walk them um, uh, out of that pasture because it, it may be okay, you know, walking, but um, if you start moving them fast and they've got to oxygenate a little bit more, like, that might just be enough to push them over the edge. So avoid stress. Um, and then, you know, good pasture management for the perilla mint. You know, if, if you've got that, you can get it sprayed, get it knocked back, and, uh, and keep it out of your pastures. <coughs> Um, anybody have this planted in the flower beds? My favorite one. <laughs> yeah, okay, and I, you know, uh, we've got it at home uh, as well. This is Lantana. Uh, it's a, you know, an ornamental that uh, it actually grows wild uh, in South Louisiana. If you get down, you know, in that uh, Oma Thibodeau, uh, that, you know, far enough south, uh, I've seen it down there. It's uh, also in uh, California, Florida. Uh, it, it'll grow wild. Uh, but this is one that, and so we're not going to see problems with this uh, here in the central part of the state unless somebody clips it, you know, uh, the flower beds and, and throws it over the fence uh, for the cows to, uh, to eat. But it is one that we occasionally see some problems with. And it's, um, leaves actually look kind of similar to, uh, to perilla mint leaves as far as the shape and they've got these little serrations along the edge. Uh, flowers come in um, yellow, orange, red. Uh, if you go to um, a nursery, you may find some that are kind of a light purple or lavender color. The lavender ones aren't quite as toxic as the orange, red, and yellow varieties. <coughs> the, um, uh, again, this is uh, typically a, a, a summer annual, but um, the ones that we had planted in our yard, I think they had lasted for about three, uh, maybe two winters, but they're, they're done now. Um, they're, they're, they're pretty black. So uh, the, the toxins are primarily in the leaves of this plant. Oh, and, and I didn't mention with, uh, with perilla mint, uh, it's uh, the whole plant. There, there's uh, all the plants toxic. Uh, the seeds are, um, the seeds and flowers actually are the most toxic parts of the plant. The whole thing is uh, potentially problematic. So um, lantadines are the, 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 the toxins in this uh, plant, primarily found in the leaves. And it doesn't take a lot. You know, two pounds of leaves for a, for a thousand pound cow. So then, you know, uh, you'll find two pounds of leaves on, on one, one decent sized plant. There are some other toxins in the fruits, but uh, they do some other things. Uh, we get liver disease, but, uh, and then kind of secondarily, we'll see some, some photosensitization where the, uh, this, the white skin um, uh, dies on these animals. You can see here where the, the, the black portions are perfectly normal, but wherever, wherever there is um, white hair, uh, and you don't have that pigmented skin, uh, can be affected. So signs uh, generally do the liver damage. Uh, you can get some kidney problems with this as well. Acute signs, so within a, a day, two, three, four days, are, are uncommon. Uh, generally what we see with this is the chronic that's usually kind of two or three weeks out. Uh, after those animals have consumed this. And then sometimes that's kind of a head scratcher because you're like, you know, what are they eating now? Two, three, four weeks ago, you know, you may not even be able to figure out what, what it was they were eating back then. So that's sometimes difficult. Um, but uh, they'll, you know, they'll get jaundiced uh, because of liver disease on, on necropsies. Their livers are, are swollen, uh, sometimes have a little bit of a greenish tint to them. Blindness. Uh, is actually kind of associated with the same thing with the photosensitization. It has to do with the, uh, the UV light. And so when, uh, when their livers aren't functioning properly, there are some, um, some compounds that are normally excreted um, through the kidneys, and, and those aren't, uh, and through the liver, actually it's more through the liver, and they're not uh, passed in the, uh, in the feces, in the manure like they should be. So they build up in the body, and they get in the bloodstream, and when they, uh, when they get into the capillaries of the skin, that's when the light from the sun hits that. 
And if, if it's pigmented skin, the light's just absorbed, but with the, um, with the white skin, it reflects and, and it causes damage to that white skin. And so the same thing happens to the, uh, to the eyes. The, uh, the, the UV light penetrates, and that's what can cause blindness, actually cause, cause a, a keratitis. These are some brown cows down south in New Orleans that um, this was uh, quite a few years ago. A friend of mine gave me these pictures. And uh, they had, you know, the what lantana was growing in some of the pastures there, and the cattle got into that. Um, here's uh, one of the livers, and it's uh, relatively swollen there. Um, treatment, and again, you know, there's no specific antidote for this. It's, uh, if, if they're having signs of photosensitization, get them in the shade, uh, get them out of the sunlight. Um, activated charcoal, so if, it's, if they recently <coughs> used stuff, uh, and, and this would, activated charcoal is used for lots of uh, poison, which you might give it to a dog or a cat or what have you. It helps bind the toxins. Now, if it's been two or three weeks uh, since they ate it, well, those plants are long since gone, and using activated charcoal isn't going to help with that, right? Uh, antibiotics, um, again, uh, it's not so much for the, uh, for the liver issues, it's more for the skin, because they're going to get infections and whatnot, but uh, it's that skin that heals off. So topical antibiotics, uh, SAS, things like that. And I, you know, we're talking about usually, you know, if you've got a herd uh, problem, you're not going to be out there putting salve on, you know, 30 or 40 cows, I don't imagine. But uh, you might be able to, you know, run them through a chute and give them a, uh, a dose of uh, Oxytet or, um, you know, something and, and help them out a little bit for a, for a period of time. But if it's, uh, you know, a few animals, one or two, something like that, you might be able to treat them a little bit. And then again, if it, you know, valuable animals, uh, trying to support them with fluids and, and other, other uh, supportive type of care uh, can sometimes be worthwhile. Here we have uh, uh, coffee senna, and, and well, here we have coffee senna down here on the uh, lower picture, and sickle pod up here. Uh, this one gets its name sickle pod because of the, the way the, uh, the, the pods hang down, they're sort of sickle shaped. Uh, Coffee senna, and these plants are related. This one is uh, uh, senna occidentalis and senna obtusifolia. Uh, so they're, they're very common, or are very uh, closely related. Uh, but the pods on this uh, coffee senna, they actually point upwards just a little bit. So you a little way to uh, tell them apart. <clears throat> they have um, uh, yellow flowers that are sort of, uh, they look like a pea. Um, they're just a common pea flower. They're in that same family. These things will grow. Here are a couple of students. Uh, this was actually down um, around Raceland. Uh, a couple of students went with me, and you can see, uh, took this picture just to kind of show you how tall these things get. So upwards of eight feet tall. <clears throat> this is uh, this one here is just a, uh, was in a garden uh, uh, outside the vet school that uh, that we grow. So I can I can show students what coffee center looks like. And uh, here's here's some of the flowers. These plants are fairly common throughout the southeast. Um, I've seen them um, uh, in a number of different places when I was in Tennessee, very common uh, in Louisiana, and uh, these will cause uh, muscle damage on cows, and they're also, they're summer annuals, a lot of people call these, uh, call these coffee weed. So we get into, uh, this is where we get into problems sometimes, what you call coffee weed and what I call coffee weed are probably two different things. Um, the, uh, the, the, the proper names for them, uh, well, probably the proper is using the scientific name, but, but you know, kind of who can remember these, much less uh, pronounce the things. But coffee senna and sickle pod, and, and another one that I usually um, uh, call coffee weed is um, is a sesamania. But well, um, so it, 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 it does get confusing sometimes, and folks will call me and, and, and ask if, if one of them's toxic and. and one of the coffee weeds really isn't, but, but these can be uh, quite problematic with cattle. As these plants mature, they become more toxic. And, uh, and then this is the one that I was going to tell you about, that as the, as the plant is dying, as it's wilting, maybe after the first frost, uh, evidently, the, at least I think, the leaves must become more palatable as cattle go out and, and maybe seek them out. The um, uh, picture with the, uh, the two students <clears throat> that one, um, cattle had been on uh, the pasture, and they had a, a large area, probably about an acre, uh, that was just uh, nothing but uh, sickle pot. Cattle hadn't bothered it, and uh, the fellow's uncle uh, sprayed it. I think he used 2,4-D. 
And so I don't know if it was the 2,4-D that the cows liked, or, uh, but the next day the leaves were wilted and the cattle went in and they just cleaned it. Uh, I mean, there was, you could, it was hard to find leaves on some of the plants. And uh, he ended up losing about six head uh, out of probably 80 or so. So um, it was a significant loss. Um, there were a few other cows while I was there that um, were affected, but, uh, but not quite to the same degree. Let me, before I get off of that, let me uh, talk a little bit more about uh, cattle are most commonly affected. You usually see problems with this in the summer and fall. That was, uh, that was in September, so kind of the right time. This one also stretches from uh, kind of all the way across the southeastern U.S. And uh, can be a problem sometimes in uh, grain crops, soybean crops, things like that. The, uh, the toxins primarily affect uh, muscle. Uh, they can also affect the gastrointestinal system, so we get some, some, uh, some diarrhea, uh, and then later on, sometimes uh, constipation. Only about uh, two pounds uh, for a thousand pound cow uh, is enough to, uh, to intoxicate them. Usually eating that amount over a period of five to seven days, so you know, they, don't have, they don't even have to eat that much at once, just kind of uh, scatter over a few days, or just one uh, on the, the, the coffee center, the one that had the pointed leaves, it's a little bit more toxic. Just an overnight fill on that's enough to, um, to intoxicate these animals. So early on, uh, usually within 24, 48 hours, you may see some diarrhea, you know, animals just kind of acting colicky. Um, but they, they tend to maintain their appetite, and, and they do that even after they go down. Um, <clears throat> they'll, get, they'll get wobbly. Uh, I've seen animals just kind of uh, walking along and, and maybe trip over a clod of dirt that they normally wouldn't. You know, they're just, they're just not quite as strong and a little bit weak uh, as they're moving. And then eventually, uh, over time, they get, there's, no, there's more muscle damage, more necrosis of the muscles and breakdown of the muscles, and they go down. Uh, once that happens, they almost never uh, recover. Um, but they're bright, alert, uh, they eat, they drink. Um, I remember trying to work on a, a, a mean old brindle uh, tiger stripe cow that uh, normally would, you know, probably try to run you out of the pasture and uh, she's down, she can't stand up and I'm trying to get a halter on her and she's, you know, trying to head button me and uh, lunging at me and stuff like that. Uh, they're, they're, everything else is normal, they just, they just can't uh, get up, they can't stand or walk. As those muscle tissues are breaking down, uh, their urine will come, become very dark, uh, almost coffee colored uh, in color. And uh, I mean, most of the time they should be humanely euthanized, but if, if they're left there, they'll, they'll typically die within a week or so. Uh, well, I forgot I had these pictures in here, but that was from that uh, farm down around Raceland, and you can see they just, they just stripped uh, all the leaves off all those plants. <coughs> So uh, on necropsy, um, the uh, pathologists are going to find muscle tissue. So oftentimes they have the streaks of, uh, of white uh, in the muscle, and that's that, that's tissue that has died. And, you know, it should be kind of pink or red. And you see that also in the heart muscle. Sometimes they can die suddenly from uh, from the heart kind of giving out. Heart will be uh, flabby as well. Again, nothing. Uh, you know, once they get down. Uh, it's just supportive care, but uh, if, you're, you know, if you know this is what's going on, it's probably best just to go ahead and put the animals out of their misery. Here's a, uh, this is just a little ice chest uh, cooler, and uh, this was uh, coffee scent in this case, the one, the one that's a little bit more toxic, you can see some seed pods here. Uh, this jar here is filled with urine. That, that's how dark the urine will get uh, on these animals, uh, as those muscles are breaking down. And this was supposed to show that uh, the muscle is, is, uh, is kind of pale looking. It's not a normal color, but that didn't come out quite like uh, I wanted. So this, uh, this is another plant we see in, uh, this is more in southeastern uh, Louisiana, the, uh, the Florida parishes, Washington, Tangipahoa, uh, along there. Uh, it doesn't grow um, really anywhere else in the state. It, it may slowly uh, move itself uh, to other areas, but right now it's kind of concentrated in that area, South Mississippi and South Alabama. This is, uh, anybody know what this is? Persimmon? What's that? Persimmon? Persimmon. No? No? It's not a bad guess, though. It's probably similar to size. Soda apple? No? Tongue. Tongue tree or tongue nut tree. Uh, T and it's spelled T-U-N-G, not like our tongues. Um, these trees were, uh, were 
Rig welder, they originate from out of Asia, but they were brought into uh, South Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama. I'm going to guess and say the 1930s, 1940s, uh, but you, anybody use tongue oil uh, as a wood preservative or a varnish? Well, that's they press the nuts uh, for that oil. And this was a, <coughs> this was a, uh, a major industry uh, in that uh, area back in the 1960s, 1970s, and, and may go back into the 50s and 40s, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but there was a major um, weather event in 1969 uh, that came from the Gulf and went, went through Gulfport, Mississippi, Hurricane Camille. And it, it just devastated uh, all these orchards and uh, the whole industry just collapsed and, and it's, it's never, never come back. But these little trees like it uh, in South Louisiana. And so they, they naturalize themselves. And uh, if you drive uh, kind of from, uh, from A to, uh, uh, to Franklin, then you'll see a lot of these just on the sides of the roads, get off on the back roads, and they're, they're pretty common. Kind of a heart-shaped leaf. Uh, the leaves have a little bit of a shiny uh, uh, presence. Uh, and then the nuts down here, uh, they're probably, um, oh, two and a half inches across, something like that. And I think there are, I think there's six, six seeds in, uh, in each one of the nuts. So that's what was pressed with oils. This a, a friend of mine gave me this picture. That's the Bunky Hardware Store. That was probably back in the uh, 70s, I guess. They sold bar tongue paint. So that they used uh, a tongue oil. <clears throat> so it's a, a small tree. It'll get up to about maybe 20, 25 feet uh, in height. Uh, these leaves are palatable. Uh, cattle will, uh, they like to eat this. So um, you know, if, you, if you have this uh, close by, you want to definitely get rid of it or uh, keep the cows away from it. Um, it causes, um, it's, it's kind of a direct irritant to, to the gastrointestinal system. And it causes severe ulceration um, in, the, in the stomachs uh, of cattle. And uh, usually within just a, 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 you know, 24 hours or so, you'll start seeing clinical signs, but uh, watery diarrhea may have some blood. Um, animals will, uh, they, look, you know, they, they just look sick. They look uh, sad, painful, and uh, the ulcers, so this is part of the adomasum, uh, one of the four stomachs that uh, cows have. You see this is an ulcer, here's one, and these develop you know, over just a, a period of uh, 24 to 48 hours. These cows, this is actually at the Southeastern Dairy uh, in Franklin. Uh, I think it was uh, 1996. Uh, I was in Tennessee, so um, someone relayed this to me and, and gave me this uh, this slide, uh, these slides, and uh, they moved 16 heifers onto a pasture, and either the folks that moved the heifers didn't know that there was a, a, a fence lined with these trees, or they didn't know the trees were toxic. I'm not sure which. But uh, the next day, they, all 16 heifers were showing signs of uh, illness. And uh, eventually, 15 of them died. Uh, they, they brought two of them to the vet school. One of those was, was one of the ones that survived out of, out of all 16 of them. So uh, they, uh, again, these leaves are palatable. Uh, cattle will consume them, so uh, be a little bit careful with those. Oak, uh, I'm sure everybody has oak trees on their place. Uh, and you're probably aware that they can be toxic to cattle. You know, people will go years and years and years and never have a problem, and then all of a sudden uh, they, may, they may lose one, two, three, or you know, half a dozen uh, animals to, uh, to apron toxicity. Um, I've, we'll see problems in the springtime uh, with, with new leaves and shoots. I've never seen that. All I've ever seen it is in the fall uh, with, with animals eating aprons that are on the ground. Cattle are primarily affected. Um, yeah, sheep and goats, uh, goats especially, uh, have a little bit of a resistance uh, to, uh, to acorn toxicity or to the, to the toxins uh, that are in acorns and oaks. Um, and then deer, you know, they, they live off of uh, acorns in the wintertime. Deer and goats have uh, some type of enzyme in their saliva <coughs> that, that break down the, uh, the tannins, the toxins that are in here. So they can live off of them pretty easily. So i got a, uh, got a real busy slide here, but uh, just to hit a couple of uh, high points. There's there's a, a lot of different species of oaks uh, throughout the United States, and and they're all toxic. Um, as I mentioned, springtime with uh, new leaves, uh, fall we're going to see problems with with aprons. They have to eat a lot of this. You know, eating you know a handful of aprons isn't going to uh, cause any problems. 
Uh, usually these animals are eating uh, you know, several pounds uh, a day for several days uh, to, to intoxicate themselves. So don't worry too much about it. You know, if you've got a few acres scattered on the ground, but if there's a lot, it may be something you want. And then are they eating them? Um, and supposedly, um, cattle will develop, and I don't know if it's, a, if it's quite like a true addiction, but they do develop a taste or a likeness sometimes uh, for aprons, and they'll seek them out. They'll, they'll go looking for them. Um, uh, my, uh, my toxicology uh, professor, Dr. Steve Nicholson, some of you may, may know of him, uh, he retired back in um, around 2000, I think, from, uh, or 2005 from LSU. He told me a story. He had, uh, a fellow called him. He had four heifers uh, that were eating aprons uh, from this tree. And uh, Dr. Steve told him, you know, get, bring them up to the uh, barn, you know, keep them there for about a week or so, and um, you know, they should be fine. So he happened to be driving in that area about a week later, decided to uh, stop by the farm, and uh, the, the, the fellow still had the cows in the corral. And so he probably let them out now and not had any problems. They opened the gate, he said those heifers galloped. Uh, to that tree and started eating acorns. <laughs> so, so, so I had to help him get them back into the corral. Um, they, they, they remembered that taste and, and sometimes uh, they like it. So what these uh, toxins, the, the tannins or galatannins, they, uh, they have a, a, an irritant effect on the, uh, on the intestines and so they'll cause diarrhea. Um, but they also, they damage the kidneys. And what uh, death from this is usually due to uh, kidney failure and dehydration. From this. So that's uh, that, a lot of stuff in here that, uh, that um, I talk about with students, but it's, it's kidney failure and uh, diarrhea that also contributes to the dehydration. You're losing a lot of water like that. Early signs you may see, if you're, if you're watching closely, you might actually see um, constipation and maybe straining. Uh, but, and then later on, uh, they may be straining to urinate. And they're, not, they're not able, to, uh, they're not able to, uh, to urinate very well. But um, as, uh, as time goes on, uh, the constipation turns to diarrhea. Sometimes there may be a little bit of blood uh, in it, not always. And then they, they just, they, they, uh, they get weak. Um, again, primarily from dehydration, go down and, um, and, and oftentimes die. And it's just showing some gut here that's just you know, very hemorrhagic, uh, very, a very angry, um, Picture of some uh, some new shoots, and so you know, cut a tree down, and that's coming up from the, you know from a stump uh, the next year that's, that's not dead yet. So those types of things uh, can be uh, potentially problematic. There's um, uh, here's a picture of a kidney, and all these little pinpoint spots. Those are hemorrhages uh, in that kidney, so it causes a lot of damage there. Uh, when you open up a cow that's uh, that's died from acre toxicity, the kidneys are just obviously pale, and they they kind of jump out at you how how pale they are. Treatment, uh, you know, again, uh, for, for most of our toxins that, that affect our livestock, there isn't anything that we can, uh, you know, pull off the shelf and, and give and make them better. Uh, and this is this is still the case here with uh, with oats. Um, so we're going to treat them symptomatically. We're going to, you know, support them, uh, give them fluids, uh, and and if they're dehydrated enough uh, and they're valuable enough animals, uh, you know, intravenous fluids may uh, would, would be the best. Um, that's going to help flush out the kidneys. Oftentimes, if you're just giving oral fluids and drenching them, uh, the, the, it, they, they can't absorb them, partly because of the GI problems that they're having. Uh, so IV fluids are, are certainly the way to go, but obviously there's a you know, great expense associated with that. So it's not going to be for every, uh, every animal that, uh, that people have. Survival, you know, if, depending on if, there, if there's not enough damage uh, for the kidneys, these animals may hang on. Uh, and get over this, but it sometimes will take you know, days to weeks before they, they fully recover. So prevention, that's the best thing, obviously, is so to limit access. And you know, if you've got an area where, um, you know, maybe a tree line, and there's uh, a lot of oaks that, uh, that would potentially drop a lot of uh, fruit on the ground, you know, maybe just keep the cows away from there, let the deer, let the squirrels, uh, let God take them, and, uh, and then move animals back on. If you can't do that, uh, you know, fence it off uh, if possible. Again, feed the animals uh, properly, keep them in good uh, body condition to start with. And, and again, you know, people go for years and years and never have problems with this. And it's just you know, something changes uh, in that cow's mind. And I think sometimes, you know, 
one cow sees another one over there eating and, and gets curious and, and it, you know, they, they kind of draw on each other and pretty soon you've got you know, several eating it. <coughs> Calcium hydroxide, uh, lime, uh, can be added to a ration uh, if, uh, if you think you might be having problems and that will help uh, bind up uh, the, uh, the tannins. Uh, so it, it decreases the ability uh, to absorb them. There's just some pictures. This is uh, cow with uh, showing signs of diarrhea. Uh, this one here, you know, she's, she's, she's just sick. She's not cleaning her, uh, her muzzle like she should be. Um, she's, uh, she feels bad. Uh, if, we, if we pull the skin down on her eyes, there's probably going to be a pretty good gap there indicating that, uh, that she's dehydrated. I'll let somebody else pull that skin down on her. Um, <laughs> walk in the uh, pasture there if you want. How much time do I have left? All right, I'll, I'll do Buckeye, and I uh, had nitrates uh, kind of as the last thing. I wasn't sure if I would have time to talk about those, but uh, um, we'll probably do Buckeye and then, and then uh, quit. Um, this is, uh, you might see, anybody have any Buckeye on the place? Yeah, okay. Um, probably as you get a little bit further north, um, you'll see more of it uh, in north Louisiana. Um, I, I've seen it uh, over in the uh, Florida parishes, but uh, not not to a great extent. This was something that I saw very frequently in, in Tennessee. Just about every fall, I, I would see some buckeye toxicity. And uh, it, it, cattle appear drunk uh, when they eat these. Uh, if you've never seen a buckeye, I didn't bring one with me. Um, I'll pass this around. Y'all are spread out socially so far. Maybe you are, but... Uh, to get it around to everybody. Um, pretty much everything's toxic on these trees, and then buckeye trees, um, some are as large as large oaks. Uh, these can be really massive uh, trees. And then that picture I showed you a minute ago, I think I have another picture of it later. It was, it's a little ornamental, but it was in a flower bed. So they, they can vary quite a bit. Uh, again, kind of like uh, aprons, uh, we see problems uh, in the spring with, uh, with new leaves. Uh, and then in the fall, uh, the nuts, uh, like that one, the, um, uh, they cause neurologic signs, and uh, to me, cows and deer are drunk. Uh, they're stumbling around, walking sideways, look like they had too many beers. Uh, and you also see some, uh, some diarrhea uh, with this as well. Early on, maybe some muscle twitching, and then that will develop into uh, to really uh, severe incoordination. Animals will sometimes have convulsions, uh, seizures. Uh, uh, Notice cattle almost kind of hopping uh, on their back legs uh, as, as they're moving around, and it'll, uh, it'll certainly kill them if they eat enough uh, in, a, in a short period of time. Activated charcoal, uh, again, trying to, to bind up the toxins or possibly uh, a lax kind of like mineral oil uh, to help move those things on out a little bit faster. <clears throat> if you get to these cows before they die, You've got a pretty reasonable chance of, of pulling them through this with a little bit of tender loving care. You know, uh, if it's hot out, you know, build a, uh, put a tarp over them, uh, you know, lean to or whatever, keep the sun off of them, make sure they got water, make sure they got something to eat. Um, and you know, sometimes uh, you have to drench them with uh, fluids, but uh, they'll oftentimes uh, respond pretty well. The uh, the first case of this, I'll I'll tell the story and then I'll quit. Um, First case I saw was uh, uh, up in a little town called Maynardville, Tennessee. This fellow called me and um, he said, I've got a cow down. I'd like you to come out and take a look at her. I'd never been out to, the, to that farm before. And so I had a couple of students with me. We, uh, we drove, it's about 30, uh, 30 miles north of Knoxville. And um, cow, it was September. Uh, the cow was laying hot. And um, he, had, he did have a little shade tarp up there. And I said, so, so did you find her here? He said, no. He said, you see that mountain back there? It's pretty hilly. And it was kind of a, a small mountain. He said, I just happened to be outside. He said, she came galloping down the side of that mountain. And she ran into the pond right there. And she swam the pond. And she ran up the bank. And this, the bank on this pond was like this. And he said, she ran up the bank. And she got all the way to the top. And she tripped. She rolled all the way back into the pond. She jumped back up. She ran back up. And she got to the top. And started down. And she tripped. And she fell. And this is where she stopped. But they said she hadn't gotten enough sense. And so I mean, I'm thinking she broke a leg, uh, you know, from all that craziness. And so I had the students you know, start taking a, uh, you know, do a physical exam. And one of them put a thermometer in her butt, and she immediately started convulsing. And um, 
So we watched her convulse for 20, 30 seconds. There's not much you can do, not much else you can do. And she stopped and they finished their, went on with their physical exam. Um, we treated her, gave her some fluids and gave her some banamine and some other things and, and, and you know, she didn't get up. Um, I asked him, I said, do you have any buckeye? Nope, nope, don't have any buckeye. How about Dallas grass? Uh, he said, uh, I'm not sure what Dallas grass is. We'll, we'll go around and look at the pastures real quick and see if you have any Dallas grass. And he added a little bit, and there was a little bit that was ergotized, and that can cause similar signs. And um, so we left. Uh, didn't have, didn't, wasn't really sure what was going on. He called the next day and he said, I've got a dead cow, and the one you treated is still laying there. I said, load them both up, bring them in. Uh, let us treat the one and we'll necrops the other. Well, the other one had a belly full of buckeyes. And so I called him back. And so he went out and he, see, he found a, a, a large tree. He said uh, it was about 50 yards back in the woods and the ground was just covered with buckeyes. And uh, so ended up losing the one cow. And the one that he brought in, she responded and, and went home. Um, but um, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a interesting story. But, and then that story I told you that he told me, that took about 20 minutes. <laughs> a lot more animation than that, but uh, kind of funny listening to it. Well, I better stop. Um, I appreciate your, uh, your attention, and uh, thank you for having me out. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll answer a couple real quick if there's time. And if there's not, uh, I'll hang around for a little bit. Yes, sir? Uh, horse milk. They live Right. Yes, sir. Now, again, you know, something eating, you know, a handful of them, that's not going to be a problem. Uh, horse, the question was horse nettle. Uh, are, the, are the yellow balls toxic? And so horse nettle is a nightshade. Uh, it'll cause um, um, gastrointestinal signs, a diarrhea, colic, that sort of thing, but also uh, neurological signs uh, if they eat enough of it. And they can kill them if they eat enough of it. But yeah, horse nettle's got so many thorns all over it, it, it tends to be pretty un unpalatable for the animals. But um, and they, they probably have to eat um, uh, oh, probably 15 or 20 pounds of it to, to make a difference. I don't see them eat the ball. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the immature, when they're, when they're still green, that's when those are most toxic. When they're yellow, they, they, they still have some toxin, but not quite as much. Anybody else? Matt, no, uh, the scientific name is Iba annua, and, and it's annual yellow or something. I'm trying to make it. Is that a toxin? Or mention it's toxic, but not very often. Tell me the name again. Iva annua is the scientific name. You said elder. I mean, you're not talking about elderberry, are you? No, no. Marsh elder. Marsh elder. Not, not to my knowledge. I'm not familiar with it. I can, um, I'll try and look it up and see real quick. But I don't think so. A few years ago, after a flood, I found a over. I got a call looking for top plants. I mean, it, that's the only plant that's out there. And I, thought, uh, you know, I don't know that to be toxic. I've never heard of it. Uh, it's it's hmm. Right, yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with that uh, as being a toxic plant uh, in this area. I don't think it is. Well, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. Good job. Thank you. Thanks.